Well, uh, we are ongoing in our study of the book of Isaiah and uh, some of the uh, events, the geopolitical events that have been taking place around us uh, recently um, kind of bring to mind much of what the prophet Isaiah speaks of and the kinds of uh, situations that he is, um, is dealing with in the lives uh, of Judah and of Jerusalem and its leadership in particular. At, and so I'm thinking of things like this week, of course, we heard about our president meeting with the leader of North Korea. They d agreed to meet together. And uh, it was so interesting to listen to the political pundits on the radio discussing this. And of course, uh, the station I listen to um, uh, is very, it tends to be very liberal <laughs> in their approach. And, uh, and uh, so everybody was complaining about the uh, the president, our president, stepping outside of the normal boundaries of political discourse, et cetera, between nations, hostile nations, et cetera. And one of the commentators said, well, the comeback to that complaint is that the, the experts and the smart guys have been doing it the same way for years, and now we have a nuclear North Korea. So maybe it's time to try something different. Now, my point is not to agree or disagree with our president. That is not what I am raising that issue to suggest. But what I am raising that issue to suggest is that we have been working for a long time to try to deal with North Korea and the threat that it presents uh, on the peninsula in that area. But we also, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, um, the, the president of Russia gave his State of the Union message and, and bragged about all the new nuclear power that they have, these nuclear weapons, including a nuclear-powered cruise missile. Now, that's not a nuclear-armed cruise missile. I'm sure it would have a nuclear warhead on it. But this is a nuclear-powered cruise missile, which means it can be fired and sent at ground level under radar defenses by going all the way around the South Pole and penetrating the United States uh, without being picked up by any of our current um, radar systems, at least as far as they know. And so you think, whoa, you know, it's like the 1960s all over again, you know, and they're no longer telling us to crawl under the desk, are they? Because they know it's like instant vaporization. But it's easy to get, you know, it's easy to get anxious about, about the things that are going on uh, in the world around us. And, you know, and you look at the rise of, of nationalism that's going on, uh, particularly in Europe, and with that rise of nationalism, the, the rise of global anti-Semitism and how it is growing more and more dangerous for those of us who are Jewish because of the rise of anti-Semitism and nationalism. Many of those ancient hatreds uh, which we had hoped had dissipated over the years apparently are just under the surface and need a quick scratch uh, to emerge. And so this morning we're going to be looking at a large chunk of Isaiah. In fact, since I left off chapter 20 from last week's message, I'm going to include chapter 20 in this week's message. So, by the grace of God, we are going to aim to go through chapter 20, 21, 22, and 23 of the book of Isaiah. Okay. So, again, yeah, so thank, thank you, Joel. Joel brought his lunch, so uh, he's, he's ready to go. But what's interesting is, is that, that uh, Judah and its kings found themselves in a, in a similar world. And that is a world that was filled with all kinds of threats to their security and to their well-being as a nation. If it wasn't Syria that was ganging up with Israel against Judah, it was Assyria. And if it wasn't Assyria they would be replaced by the Babylonians who would then be replaced by the Medo-Persians. And so the, the history that was going to take place, we, we look back on it, for them, it, most of it hadn't taken place yet. And so they lived in a very threatening environment and their desire to be at peace within that environment was very, very powerful. And so king, the kings of Israel, like Ahaz, who we read about in chapter 7, and King Hezekiah, uh, who we will be reading about in chapter 36, were desperate to find a way to survive. They were desperate to find 
a way to secure peace and prosperity for themselves and for the nation of Israel. And of course, they were tempted to find what they were looking for in all the wrong places. They were tempted to find it in all the wrong places. And in fact, the leadership of Judah ultimately sought it in all of the wrong places. And so in today's rather long section, Isaiah is going to conclude his series of ten oracles. Ten oracles. These are ten uh, burdens or heavy messages, if you will, that were given in reference to Judah's relationship with the nations around them as they sought the, the peace and the uh, prosperity that they desired for themselves and their people. And so Isaiah gives us these oracles and as we discovered previously the oracles sometimes address issues or events that are going to be that are going to take place in the near future and other times the oracles take place are directed to events that will take place in the distant future some of that future we don't even are not even clear on yet and some of it is future to our own day perhaps and so as we look at this rather large chunk of Isaiah this morning, I want us to be thinking about what does Isaiah have to teach us about finding safety, security, and prosperity? What does he have to teach us? This is the same theme that we've been looking at for the last several weeks because this, this is the theme that all of these oracles pick up on. And so what I want us to see as we look at this text this morning if we want to find a place of safety, we have to look the right way. We have to look the right way. And that the whole idea of looking the right way or looking to the right thing comes out of one of the oracles that we are going to be looking at this morning. But before we get into them, I'd like to uh, quickly just uh, show you the uh, home links. Again, these are printed. They're available. If you haven't already received a copy, uh, be sure to stop and pick one up off of the visitor desk or off of the... Um, Thank you, the credenza at the back of uh, the sanctuary. Uh, but these questions are intended to help you continue to think about and apply the text that we're going to be looking at this morning. And so they are, what common fate do the nations suffer? Who brings this to pass? To what did Jerusalem look? To whom should they look? To whom does our world look? And uh, to whom can all look? And I, my guess is that you will be able to answer most of those questions right now because they're the same questions we've been dealing with in one way or another over the last several weeks. And then next week, I am hoping by the grace of God to look at a slightly brighter picture in Isaiah verses, uh, chapters 24 and 25. And so, what does Isaiah have to teach us about finding the safety, security, and prosperity for which we long? What does he have to teach us from these concluding articles, or oracles rather. And again, what I want us to see is that if we want to find, please, Isaiah is telling us you've got to look the right way. You've got to look the right way. And the first thing that I want us to see is going to come from a very, very fast overview of the remaining oracles with the exception of one. And these are the oracles, each of these oracles are based on, there are five of them, and they are based on uh, foreign nations. And then we'll be looking at the last oracle, which is uh, snuck in between, uh, <clears throat> in between a couple of the others uh, for our final point. But this is his point. He says, don't look around, don't look around you. In other words, look the right way. And he says, don't look around you because no one else has the answer. Don't look around you because no one else has the answer. Isn't that an important thing to know? Isn't it important to know that when you are in a crisis situation, when your peace is gone, when you are looking for a place of safety, when you're looking to a route to uh, the kind of prosperity that God desires for his people, not the health and wealth kind, but normal prosperity that God normally brings into people's lives, he says, Isaiah says, don't look around you. Don't look around you because nobody else has the answer. And that's exactly what these articles are about. 
over and over and over again to us, Isaiah's readers, and to those he spoke at the time he gave these oracles, the kings of Judah in particular. And so all of the nations to whom Israel might look are themselves helpless. That's his point. That's the point that gets made over and over again in different ways. For instance, look with me, if you will, at Isaiah chapter 20. Very short chapter, only six verses. And this comes at the tail of the oracle about what was going to happen uh, uh, to... uh, I'm sorry... Uh, to Egypt, okay? And so this is the conclusion of what's going to happen to Egypt. Now, the oracle about Egypt was a more distant future that Isaiah was explaining to the kings. It was not going to happen in their own day. And so as we had seen in earlier chapters, Isaiah will sometimes follow a prediction of the distant future with a more immediate prediction as a validation that what will take place further down the road will in fact take place. And so that's what he does here. He says in this in verse 20, I'm sorry, verse 1 of chapter 20, in the year that the commander came to Ashdod when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him and he fought against Ashdod and captured it. Okay, so basically this is happening around 711 BCE, all right, 711, the beginning of the uh, eighth, or the end of the eighth century, and so this is when Assyria is ascendant, and they come and they attack Ashdod, which is on the coastal plain, a city on the coast there, uh, just west of uh, Jerusalem, down the mountains, across the plain, etc. It says, at the time the Lord spoke through Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loosen the sackcloth from your hips and take your shoes off your feet. And he did so, going naked and barefoot. And so here's God says to Isaiah, look, I want you to live out a parable in front of my people because I really want to drive home the message that they can't look to the Philistines. They can't look to any other city, state, or nation around them for help because they themselves are going to be uh, destroyed or taken captive. And so he goes on and he says, And the Lord said, Even my servant Isaiah has gone naked and barefoot three years as a sign and token against Egypt and Cush. So the king of Assyria will lead away the captives of Egypt and the exiles of Cush, uh, young and old, naked, barefoot, uh, with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. And so what's what's the oracle? What's the oracle? It's simple. The oracle is, is that Ashdod is going to fall to the Assyrians and Ashdod was under the control of the Egyptians and the Egyptians can't even keep control of Ashdod, which is close to you. What makes you think they're going to help you? That's it. Don't look around you. Don't look to Egypt to help you. And so that was a, more, that was a, a, a historically closer event that was going to take place to validate a more distant event uh, with the fall of Egypt itself. And so then he goes on in Isaiah 21, uh, verses 1 through 10. Oh, I forgot I had slides prepared for this. And so here is uh, the first article, chapter 20, is in regard to uh, Egypt and Ethiopia or Cush. And so here's Jerusalem, and God is saying, and Ashdod is over here on the, on the coast, and so he's saying, look, Egypt can't protect Ashdod from the Assyrians. What makes you think Egypt is going to be able to protect you? And so he says, don't look around. Don't look there. Don't look there for help. And then he goes on in uh, chapter 21, verses uh, 1 through 10, and we have the oracle regarding Babylon. Look with me at verse 1. It says, the oracle concerning the wilderness of the sea uh, as windstorms in the Negev sweep on sweep on it comes from the wilderness from a terrifying land and so what he's talking about when he's I'm sorry when he says the uh, the wilderness of the sea it's it's a very strange expression there are a bunch of different um, different scholarly guesses 
as to the, what he exactly meant by this phrase. But basically you can see here is Babylon and here is, this is desert. This is all desert. Now here Babylon is along obviously the Euphrates River and so uh, it's more fertile here. But this whole area that, it, that Babylon dominated was a, a desert, a wilderness. And when it talks about a sea of the wilderness, it is talking about uh, a, a national place of um, uh, a natural place of he's talking about uh, let me just say it this way he's talking about the Babylonian plain and we know he's referring to Babylon and that area because that's he talks about Babylon uh, in the following verses in verse 9 in fact he names it in verse 9 he says now behold uh, here comes a troop of riders horsemen in pairs and one says Fallen, fallen is Babylon. And so when did that happen? Well, Babylon fell in about 540 BCE. So this is something quite in the future to Isaiah's own day. And so it fell, of course, to the Medo-Persians, and media is mentioned here in our text. Look with me at verse 2. We're going to jump back. He says, A harsh vision has been shown to me. The treacherous one still deals treacherously and the destroyer still de destroys go up Elam lay siege media I have made an end of all the groaning she has caused that is the groaning caused by Babylon for this reason my loins are full of anguish pains have seized me like the pains of a woman in labor and he's going on and he you'll notice if you read through all of these oracles these last few oracles he talks a lot about how this, these visions that God has given him of the future just break his heart, just emotionally wear him out. But the picture that, that this oracle regarding uh, Babylon is that, that in the time of Hezekiah, King Hezekiah hoped that Babylon would help protect him against Assyria and was tempted to seek their support in fact he did seek their support by welcoming their emissaries and we'll read about that later in chapter 36 and following but what's the oracle about the oracle is about that Babylon itself is going to fall and I just read that verse for you but look with me if you will uh, in verse 4 and following Isaiah again reflecting on his own mental or emotional state he says my mind reels horror overwhelms me the twilight I long for has been turned for me into trembling in other words the rest is not there they set the table they spread out the cloth they eat they drink rise up captains oil the shields and so what is that a picture of? That's a picture of the fall of Babylon as we read about it in the book of Daniel where during a feast, Belshazzar's feast, the Medes and the Persians found a way into the city and conquered the city which began, was part of the fall, the ultimate fall of Babylon and the ascendancy of the Medo-Persian Empire over that area. And so again, Isaiah is saying to the kings of Judah he's saying look don't look around you don't look to Babylon because Babylon is going to fall Babylon will not be able to help you and then we go on now the next oracle is an oracle of uh, in some of our translations it says uh, Duma and other translations it says Edom and the reason for that is that the Masoretic text has Duma and the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, has uh, the Greek equivalent of Edom in it. And uh, because Seir is mentioned in this prophecy, some feel that the Septuagint understanding of the text is more accurate. Others say, no, the Masoretic text makes more sense because geographically it makes more sense. And I'll explain that here because this is Duma. And Duma is an oasis in the middle of the desert. And you can see these lines, they're very faint, but all of these lines are major trade routes through the desert. And so Duma was a major oasis in the midst of 
the desert. And so what he's going to argue is that, uh, that Duma itself are anxious about their future. Look with me, if you will. This is just this is a very short uh, oracle, and we can read it in its entirety, verses 11 and 12 in chapter 21. The oracle concerning Edom or Duma, one keeps calling to me from Seir, which uh, is a mountain over here, and he's saying, one keeps calling to me from Seir, Watchman, how far gone is the night? Watchman, how far gone is the night? The watchman says, morning comes, but also night. If you would inquire, inquire, and come back again. And so basically, the, the person who's crying out is looking for encouragement. And the response is, no, I can't give you encouragement. I don't know what's going on. Come back later. Maybe I'll know more. And so even Duma cannot provide them an answer or help of any kind in their anxiety. And then the next oracle goes on in verses 13 to 17 of chapter 21, which is an oracle regarding Arabia. Arabia, and it says, verse 13, the oracle about Arabia. In the thickets of Arabia you must spend the night, O caravans, of the Dedanites. And so it's like, huh? Scratching your head. So here's a, here's a slide to help us make a little bit of sense of this. So Arabia, when he says Arabia, he's talking about this entire desert region was known as Arabia. And so when he talks about the Dedanites, he's talking about a group of people who lived here. And uh, Kedar is a region in the northern part of Arabia. And so basically, what he goes on to say is that, um, that even though they tried to help fugitives who were fleeing the fighting, that they were even unable to do that. And the point that Isaiah is making, again, to Judah and its kings is if they can't help themselves and the refugees in their own area, how can they possibly help you as a defense against what is to come? And so that's the uh, oracle about Arabia. And then we're going to skip over the next oracle, the oracle, the Valley of Vision, which is about Jerusalem in, in chapter 22. And we're going to pick up uh, briefly with the last oracle, uh, the oracle about Tyre in Isaiah 23, verses 1 to 18. And uh, if you'll turn quickly there as well, this is the final oracle. It says, the oracle concerning Tyre. Well, O ships of Tarshish, for Tyre is destroyed without house or harbor. It is reported to them from the land. It, it is reported to them from the land of Cyprus. And so here's another here's another map. And so here's Tyre up on the sea coast of the Mediterranean, above north of Jerusalem. And Tyre was a major, major economic power in its day. And they shipped goods all over the Mediterranean world and, and further than that. And when it talks about Tarshish, uh, some scholars believe that it's the Tarshish that we would know from Spain. And that even the things that they shipped, they shipped as far as Spain. And, there's, and the oracle says that Tarshish is going to weep because all of the products and produce and things that came through Tyre would no longer be coming. And so there's this picture of, of complete devastation uh, of their economic power. He says, be silent, you inhabitants of the coastland, you merchants of Sidon. And so Sidon is um, right next door uh, to Tyre, also on the water. Your messengers crossed the sea and were on many waters. The grain of the Nile and the harvest of the river was her revenue. And so here's, here's Egypt, and this is the Nile here. And this was the breadbasket of much of the Mediterranean world at the time. And so they shipped their grain, Egypt shipped their grain through Tyre all over the place. The same way that American grain gets shipped all over the world. And so this oracle goes on and it describes the destruction of this amazing uh, economic power. And it says that they're going to be devastated by the Lord because of their pride. Look at verses 8 to 12. 
in chapter 23. Who has planned this against Tyre, the bestower of crowns, whose merchants were princes, whose traders were the honored of the earth? The Lord of hosts has planned it to defile the pride of all beauty, to despise all the honored of the earth. Overflow your land like the Nile, O daughter of Tarshish. There is no, there are no more restraint. He has stretched his hand out over the sea. He has made the kingdoms tremble. The Lord has given a command concerning Canaan to demolish its strongholds. He has said, you shall exalt no more, O crushed virgin daughter of Sidon. That's a reference to Tyre. Arise, pass over to Cyprus. Even there you will find no rest. Just complete devastation. And we don't know exactly. Uh, there are a number of times when they were invaded, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he goes on and he talks about a 70-year period uh, in uh, verses, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, verse 15, it says, Now in that day Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years like the days of one king. At the end of 70 years it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the harlot. Take your harp. Walk about the city, O forgotten harlot. Pluck the strings skillfully. Sing many songs that you may be remembered. And so he says that, that, that Tyre's future is going to be like that of a harlot who has to remind people of her, her wiles, etc., etc. But then he goes on in verses 17 and 18, and he concludes the oracle with this. He says, it will come about at the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre. Uh, <clears throat> and, this, and this really confused me when I read it, so I, that's why I want to stop and take just a second to explain it. Then she will go back to her harlot's wages and will play the harlot with all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. Now that doesn't sound like a good thing or something that God would contone, does it? And yet the next verse says, her grain and, and her harlot's wages will be set apart to the Lord. It will not be stored up or hoarded, but her grain will become sufficient food and choice attire for those who dwell in the presence of the Lord. Now we know from Deuteronomy, it's against the Mosaic code to bring the wages of a harlot into the sanctuary. And so this is like a real, like, huh? Real head scratcher. But the idea here is, is that the picture of the wages of a harlot is simply a picture of her vast economic international trade. And so what God is saying in the end of this article is that even Tyre, once she is restored at some point in history, her wealth will serve God's purposes and God's people. And so he finishes up with that last reminder that to not look around you at the people around you because no one has the answer. Now God's message to Judah and to us uh, through these oracles is, is simple. Do not look around because those around you will not succeed as God intends. As God intends. It's not that they fail of their own weight, of their own accord. It's not that they fail through the mere whims of history, but all of their attempts to find peace, to build strength, to build unity, are going to fail because God himself will cause them to fail. That's an important part of the message. And so God's message is to not look around because those around you will not succeed by God's plan. And the world is still seeking its own answers apart from God, isn't it? Isn't it? Our world is still seeking the big picture answers apart from God. Radical, atheistic, economic systems and states, right? Radical, atheistic economic systems and states. So we're thinking about the former USSR, we're thinking about uh, Venezuela that's falling apart. And they are not falling apart simply because it is a faulty economic system. They languish ultimately because God will not let them prosper. They will not, he will not let them prosper ultimately. That we not only look to radical atheistic economic systems, etc., 
we look to non-sectarian global organizations. Non-sectarian global organizations. So what do we mean by that? What's the first organization that comes to your mind uh, when I offer that description to you? None, right? Okay, well, because I'm referring to the UN, right? I want to read for you a statement about the purpose of the UN from their website. The United Nations came into being in 1945 following the devastation of the Second World War with one central mission, the maintenance of international peace and security. Sound familiar? Where do we find peace? Where do we find security? How do we bring about prosperity for the entire world? We start the United Nations. That's the, that's the tip, the trick. The UN does this by working to prevent conflict, helping parties in conflict make peace, peacekeeping, and creating the conditions to allow peace to hold and flourish. That, it's a great vision, isn't it? Sign me up. I'll vote for that. God will not allow it to prosper, ultimately. Will not allow it to prosper. And we also look to private foundations, not just uh, big non-sectarian things, but we look to private foundations with lots of money. And uh, I listen to public radio, and so I hear a lot about the uh, uh, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, right? Uh, that are, because they are, here's their, this is from their website. The foundation supports creative people, effective institutions, and influential networks building a more just, verdant, and that means green, and peaceful world. And so these guys have a 6.3, this, this information is a couple of years old, so it's probably even more than this now, a $6.3 billion endowment to do this. $6.3 billion. That's a lot of dollars. And they're located right here in Chicago, so if you need money, that's the place to go. But you get my point? My point is the world is still looking for these things. The world is still looking for these things. And God's message to us is stop looking around you. And not only do we look for these things as nations and governments, but we look for the same kind of things as individuals, don't we? We're still doing this. Every generation has a way. Religious systems, that's what religious systems are all about. That's why Islam is such a force because it is not just a religion, it is a political system. And it is a political system by the force of, of law, its own law, and the force of arms in some cases is going to bring worldwide peace. And so religious systems offer that. Now, other religious systems offer it through, uh, through more spiritual means in terms of uh, getting in touch with the universe. And if everybody would just chill, we could all get along with each other. And then we also rely, as individuals, on secular religious systems, right? What do I mean by secular religious systems? I mean things like atheism. Atheism is as much a religious system as anything. Because you need as much faith, if not more, to abide by the tenets of atheism than you do to believe in an intelligent, pre-existent creator God. And so atheism is what some people are holding on to, thinking, no, this is the answer. If everybody would just reject religion, because we all know religion is the cause of all the wars in history, and if we would just embrace atheism, then we could all get along. We could all get along. And, and it's not just atheism as a secular religious system, but in our country, we are enamored of counseling psychology, that we look to the gurus of psychology to tell us how we can live in peace with one another, how we can get along with one another. And why do I call that a secular, a secular religious system? Because every, every school of counseling psychology has a doctrine, has a doctrine that they live by. They have a theological system that they live by. They, live, they have a doctrine of, of God, of origins, where we came from. They have a doctrine of humanity, people, where we came from. And they have a doctrine of sin, what's wrong with us. 
and they have a doctrine of salvation is how we can fix ourselves and they have a doctrine of sanctification of how we can become better and better people. It's a secular religious system, a secular, and we are looking to these things for the peace that we so desperately need in our world and in, uh, and in our own lives. And so I want to read this. I, j I just got to read this because this is what came to my mind. Uh, you'll, you'll recognize these lyrics right away. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion, too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer. Yeah, but I'm not the only one. Sad, but true. I hope someday you'll join us, God forbid, and the world will be as one. Okay? This is, this is religious doctrine. This is secular religious doctrine. And the book of Isaiah and these oracles of Isaiah is God's message to us saying, don't look around you. Don't look around you. Nobody else has the answer. Nobody else has the answer. And all of those answers will fail by God's will. Why is that? The same reason the Tower of ba Babel fell. Man said, let us build a tower. Let us make a name for ourselves. And God says, look what they're doing. And he destroys the tower. He scatters humanity across the earth. He confuses our languages because he knows that any kingdom we build will lead to our ultimate destruction. And his kingdom and his kingdom alone is the kingdom that will bring us the peace and the security and the prosperity that we so long for. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to do point two next week. All right? But here's the, here it is. So if we're not looking to those around us, we got, need to look to the one who can do it. And this oracle about the Valley of Vision, and I would encourage you to read it. You can ignore next week's verses because now they're wrong. But read the, the, the Valley of Vision oracle and look for the hint that God gives us about the solution because he identifies one more failure for us in that prophecy and he hints at his solution and we all know his solution is who is Messiah Jesus and so I don't want to end this morning without saying this if God has brought you here this morning and you are still searching for that place of security and you have heard the message of these oracles and you realize that yes I have looked here I have looked there I have tried this I have tried that it is all bankrupt none of it works where do I go what do I do God's message to you this morning is turn to Jesus is turn to my Messiah turn to the one and only one who will bring peace. He brings peace between a sinful and fallen humanity and a holy and righteous God through his death and his resurrection. And that can be yours through faith in him. And he brings peace to the earth when he returns and rules and reigns in power and might and righteousness and holiness and truth. And so the peace that you look for, you can find, you can begin to experience today by putting your faith in Messiah Jesus, by turning from your sin, by turning away from all those other solutions and saying, God, I want your son, your king, to be my king. And God will meet you and you will begin to experience a peace that goes past all understanding. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word and we thank you for these oracles and this consistent message that, that you had Isaiah hit on over and over and over and over again that, that, that the key to finding peace is looking the right way. And Lord, you know our hearts and you know how prone we are to look around us. And so we pray, Lord, that we would stop doing that and instead look up to you 
the only solution and look to your Son, our only Savior. In his name, amen.